Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm your host, David Tear. And today I thought I'd do something uh, different. Um, I've decided that I'm going to, you know, every other day I'm going to do a video on some sort of random math topic, uh, you know, instead of sticking with the usual curriculum. I, I just, I'm working on a, a video series on first year calculus, and I just completed uh, derivatives, but I figure, you know, maybe it's a good idea to try something different today. So today I'm going to talk about conic sections. Uh, sometimes they're just called conics or sometimes they're called quadratic equations. Uh, um, anyway, uh, let's begin. So uh, like, like the name suggests, a conic section is just a curve that you obtain when you intersect uh, a plane with a cone. And you have to remember that a cone actually has two sides to it. Uh, usually people think of a cone as just a single cone, like this picture shows. But actually, there's two parts of a cone. There's uh, if you if you if you like they meet at the vertex so there's an upside down version of the same cone above it um, that just makes uh, the equation simpler and uh, um, and uh, so uh, what are the four types of conics well they're shown here so the one on the left is a circle that's the simplest one that's just what you get when you intersect a plane that's uh, that's um, perpendicular to the axis of the uh, uh, the symmetry axis of the cone, uh, and that, you know, that gives you a circle by symmetry. And then if you tip it a little bit, if you tip the plane, uh, but you still intersect the uh, plane with uh, one portion of the uh, cone, um, then you get an ellipse, which is really just kind of a, an elongated circle. And then if you tip it even more, uh, you tip it to the point where the, uh, the plane is parallel to the... Uh, the um, uh, rotational axis of a cone. So a cone has kind of a uh, rotational axis. This would this is a line where you rotate it about the symmetry axis, and that generates the cone. And if you take a plane that's parallel to that, and then the, it turns out the intersection, the curve that intersects the cone with this plane, is now a parabola. And if you tip it uh, even further than that. So that now this plane is intersecting both the portions of the cone, you get a hyperbola. And the reason that it's nice to use these two portions of the cone is that the hyperbola actually has two components, um, and they're uh, they're uh, kind of symmetric about each other. Um, but anyway, these are the four types of conic sections. Uh, um, and uh, actually, I lied a little bit because there there are three sort of degenerate cases in addition to these four. There's cases where you don't get a conic section at all. I mean, you can put the plane right straight through the, the middle of the cone, which is just the vertex, and then you just get a point. Or you could intersect the plane with a, the uh, um, axis that generates the cone, and then you get just a single line. Or you can uh, intersect uh, the plane um, with the cone in such a way that the plane passes through the vertex. And in that case, you get two intersecting lines. But these three degenerate cases are not, are not considered to be conic sections, even though they are really sections of a conic. They don't, know, they don't satisfy quadratic uh, equations. And, and like I said, a conic section is also called a quadratic equation in two variables. So it you know, has a nice form. I mean, the, if you just write a, like a homogeneous, well, it's not even homogeneous. If you just write a quadratic equation in two variables, all that means is a polynomial equation where the maximum degree of any of the terms is 2. So x squared, xy, and y squared all have degree 2. And then x and y just have degree 1. And then, so you can see what the general form looks like. You have these three, the first three terms are the quadratic terms. ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared. Those are the only types of quadratic terms you can get. And then you have the linear terms, dx plus ey. And finally, you have a constant term, f. And that is the most general form of a quadratic equation in two variables. And uh, except for degenerate cases, this uh, quadratic uh, uh, polynomial in two variables is the equation of a conic section. Pretty remarkable. Um, so every conic section has a form in the xy plane that looks like this. 
And you can classify these things by what's called their discriminant. Uh, and the discriminant is this quantity I call delta here. And it's just b squared minus 4ac. This should look familiar to you because you also use it when you solve the quadratic formula. It's the same, basically the same equation. And it, the reason the discriminant's nice as far as conic sections go is because depending on the sign, S-I-G-N, of the discriminant, you get different types of conic sections. So uh, in the case where the discriminant is negative, you get either a circle or an ellipse. If the discriminant is equal to zero, you get a parabola. And if the discriminant is greater than zero, you get a hyperbola. Um, so that, that, that tells you what type of uh, conic section you get from this general formula. Unfortunately, this general formula isn't very easy to work with. And the reason it's not is mainly because of this term xy, this xy term. If that xy term weren't present, you would have a, 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 a conic section that's aligned with the, the, the coordinate axes, the x and y axes. But if you allow for the b to be non-zero, you got a rotated conic section. If you don't want to rotate it, you have to set b equal to zero. Of course, you can always rotate it and change your coordinate systems. That gives you kind of complicated, uh, you know, uh, chain, um, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, it is possible by rotating uh, a conic section to get into what's called a standard form. And these are the standard forms of conic sections. There's a lot on the slide. I'm not going to go th through all these equations, but there are standard equations for each of the conic sections. Circles Probably the simplest. This is just uh, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. hk, this is the coordinate of the center. I think they use h and k for each of these conics here. So h comma k is, is uh, in this case, it's the, it's the coordinates of the center of the circle. And if it was centered at the origin, you would just get x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is the radius has a nice equation. And then uh, uh, ellipse, you have like x minus h quantity squared over a squared plus y minus k quantity squared over b squared equals 1. a and b are what are known as the semi-major and semi-minor axes. Um, actually, uh, it could be if, if, if a is bigger, greater than b, then you get a, a ellipse that looks like the one on the left you know, elongated along the x-axis. And if A is less than B, you get one that's elongated on the y-axis. I think you still call the major axis the longer one. So the major axis could be along the x-axis or along the y-axis, depending on how it's elongated. That's ellipses. And then hyperbolas, you have similar equations for hyperbolas. I think it's x minus h quantity squared over a squared plus y minus k quantity squared over b squared equals 1. And then that gives you these things uh, that are shown on the right. And one thing I didn't mention about the ellipses and the hyperbolas, they have these points in them known as foci. So an ellipse, and a, both an ellipse and a hyperbola have two foci. Uh, and uh, uh, in the case of an ellipse, uh, what, another way you can define an ellipse is just a set of points where the sum of the distances from each focus is constant. Uh, and then uh, for a hyperbola, it's the difference that's constant. So you can kind of think of a hyperbola as almost like a, the inverse of an ellipse. Uh, but anyway, that's ellipses and hyperbolas. Finally, parabolas. And parabolas have different forms depending on whether they open up along the x-axis or the y-axis. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, the standard form is something like, what is it, x minus. So now you now the h comma k is, is what's called the vertex of the parabola. And I think if it opens up uh, along the y-axis, say it goes up along the y-axis, uh, that's probably the kind of parabola you're most used to. That would have a form, uh, I think it's x minus h quantity, or no, it's, yeah. Yeah, x minus h quantity squared equals 4py. p is now the di distance. Uh, parabola has a focus, too. And p is the distance of the focus from the vertex. So uh, and if, if it opens up uh, along the y-axis, it's x minus h quantity squared equals 4py. Uh, could, be, uh, um, could be minus 4py if it opens down. Um, if it opens to the left, you just have to switch the roles of x and y. So now you have y squared, y minus k quantity squared equals 4p x minus h. Um, 
So anyway, those are the parables. Those are the standard forms of all the all the conic sections. And they're not that hard to remember the formulas for. Uh, and they're nice. Um, anyway, uh, and now uh, I, I've just given you the math uh, uh, regarding conic sections. Now let's have a little bit of fun with them. Why do we care about conic sections? Well, it turns out that conic sections occur a lot in physics. Um, and I'm going to give you several examples. For instance, the orbits of uh, satellites or the orbits of planets, if you like, around the sun. Uh, these are all conic sections, and you can get each different type. Um, the planets are all ellipses. The orbits of the planets are all ellipses, with the sun as one of its foci. And similarly, if you had a satellite orbiting the Earth, it's the same idea. Uh, if, if it's a satellite that doesn't escape from the Earth, then its orbit is also an ellipse with the center of the Earth as one of its foci. And, uh, you know, it could be a circle if its altitude is constant, or you could make it more and more eccentric by giving it additional velocity, uh, additional, you know, velocity at its, uh, what is it called, perigee, the point on its orbit that's closest to the center of the Earth. Um, so the more and more speed you give the satellite at its perigee, the more and more elongated the ellipse becomes. And eventually, when you get to what's called the escape velocity, then the orbit is no longer an ellipse, it becomes a parabola. Uh, we had to reach escape velocity when we went to the moon, by the way. We had to escape from the gravity of the Earth. That was the only way to get to the moon. And... Uh, uh, and then if you go past the escape velocity, you got a hyperbola. Uh, and, and both the parabola and the hyperbola are open curves. That means unless you, uh, you know, unless you fire up your engines again, you're going to escape from the Earth. You're never going to come back. And you probably don't want that. So you're probably going to want to fire up your engines and come back to Earth if you're going to do that. But anyway, those are the three different types of uh, planetary or, or orbits of satellites. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you can also come back down to Earth. Uh, it turns out that the trajectories of falling bodies in the absence of uh, wind resistance uh, are parabolas. That's pretty easy to prove using Newton's laws. Um, I mean, if you threw the ball straight up in the air, it wouldn't be a parabola. It would just be a straight line going up and then coming back down. But if you give it a little bit of horizontal velocity, then you get a parabola. And depending on how much horizontal velocity you give it, the parabola gets wider and wider. But it's always a parabola. Um, anyway, and hyperbolas, uh, um, it turns out that if you have two interfering waves, circular waves, um, um, then uh, the uh, um, places where the waves cancel, the uh, so you're going to get both constructive and destructive interference from these waves. And it turns out you get, well, you get both uh, constructive and destructive interference along these hyperbolas. Uh, and the reason they're hyperbolas is because the difference of the distances between the two sources has to be constant. It has to be, I mean, in the case of constructive interference, the difference of the distances has to be an integral multiple of the wavelength. We're assuming these, both of these waves have the same wavelength. And if it's destructive interference, that means that the uh, um, difference of the distance has to be um, like n plus a half times lambda, where n is an integer. So it's a half a wavelength difference. The crest of one wave has to meet the trough of the other wave. So uh, that's where you get hyperbolas. And uh, the other thing about these conic sections, they have really interesting reflective properties. At least ellipses and parabolas do. And uh, you probably know about parabolic mirrors. This is how reflecting telescopes work, by the way. It's also how satellite dishes work. So what happens is, imagine you have a satellite dish. Imagine this, you have a satellite dish that's shaped like a parabola, as shown. And you have, uh, say, light. Um, coming in from, from outer space. Say, uh, the simple case to consider here is that it's coming uh, a, in a direction that's uh, uh, parallel to the symmetry axis of the parabola. And if that's the case, you have this uh, kind of plane wave of uh, light rays coming in, and then they reflect, they all reflect off of the 
off of the satellite dish or the telescope, if you like, and then they get focused, uh, they all meet. All, all these rays meet at the focus of the, of the satellite dish, which is nice because then that's where you get your image. So that's how reflecting telescopes work. It's also how, how satellite dishes work. It's how we receive signals from outer space. Pretty cool. And uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is uh, Whispering Gallery. You don't have to use a parabola to get this uh, reflective property. You can. You know, there's actually rooms that are shaped like this. These are called Whispering gal the Galleries. The rooms shaped like ellipses. And why would you want this? Well, it turns out that if if the if the walls are are good reflectors, they have good acoustic properties. Then uh, if you stand at one of these foci of this ellipse, and you can you can just whisper, and then you can have a friend uh, at the other focus. You can just whisper. This room could be a really big room, as long as nobody else. You, you, other people could even still be talking in the room, but you could just whisper to your friend, and they'll hear you. Because all, all the sound waves are going to get reflected off the walls and they're going to get focused at the other focus. Pretty nice. Uh, so that's how a whispering gallery works. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that completes my video for today on conic sections. Thank you for watching. Long live math and I'll see you guys next time.